Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who, who has made a history by becoming the first Indian Prime Minister to visit Brunei Dar Salaam. He has received a grand ceremonial welcome from the Crown Prince Haji Al Motaddin and the Indian diaspora. This meeting is incredibly important, particularly given China's escalating aggression in the South China Sea. Now, Brunei is located on the northern shore of Borneo in the South China Sea. It is the smallest, yet the most rich state in the world with a population of less than 5 lakh. This tiny nation covers 5,765 square kilometers with a GDP of $33.8 billion. This small nation has been ruled by the same Sultan family for 600 years. It is a socialist society and possibly the closest that any country has come to a complete welfare state because the Sultan's government pays for education, health care and most other living expenses of its citizens financed through Brunei's massive oil and natural gas wealth, thus giving them the title of quote-unquote the shell fair. Brunei embodies the definition of a mono-economy with oil and natural gas making up to 99% of its export. The question then arises is, why is this meeting between Brunei and India significant and what really can we anticipate? I have with me Mahesh Sachdev, former diplomat, Professor Madhav Nalapa, the editorial director of the Sunday Guardian, Patikrit Payne, geopolitical analyst, and Mayor General, retired Sanjay Meston, defense expert, also with us on the broadcast. Let me begin this conversation with the if I can, Ambassador Sachdev, Ambassador Sachdev, if you can perhaps uh, shed some light on the significance of Brunei for our viewers, sir. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chopra. I uh, would try to do that. Uh, it, you said that it was a first uh, visit by Indian Prime Minister, but well, uh, uh, that stands to uh, be amended a bit. For uh, in Dr. 40 years. Manmohan, Dr. Manmohan yes. Singh visited uh, uh, Brunei in 2013, uh, but it was a it was not a bilateral visit. It was for ASEAN summit uh, that India was a partner country of. So uh, this is the first bilateral visit by an Indian Prime Minister, and that's that's where the significance of the visit lies in the bilateral scope. Uh, secondly. Sultan of Brunei has paid four visits since early 1990s to India. Uh, so it was a bit asymmetric uh, relationship, uh, which Prime Minister's visit, the first bilateral visit, sets right. Secondly, I think, as you, you might have noticed, uh, India's uh, multilateral economic diplomacy is giving way to bilateralism. We are not so keen on regional trade agreements or free trade agreements with groups uh, for various reasons. These have not been uh, conducive to India's own interests. While our imports have gone up, exports have not risen commensurately because Indian exporters are normally smaller and uh, they lack the savviness and aggressiveness of uh, uh, multilateral trade agreements uh, that, uh, that require them to have. Therefore, be it UAE, be it other countries, uh, we want a bilateral relationship, bilateral SICA as it is called, Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, Cooperation Agreement etc. Uh, there are various names being bandied. So okay. by, while we have a, a, a FTA with, uh, uh, with with ASEAN, this has not been uh, too helpful to India's own interest. Right. So we wanted to we want to get it done bilaterally and Brunei is one of the important source for oil and gas for India. Uh, secondly there are uh, many possibilities of funding because it's a capital-rich country. The FDI into India would be uh, would be important part. Thirdly, South China Sea is an area 
where uh, Chinese aggressiveness has caused a bit of uh, perceptional difficulties to the ASEAN countries, and Brunei is one of them. So therefore, the yes. uh, significance of the visit would lie in both economic as well as political domains. Thank you. Okay, I want to bring in Professor Nalapad into the conversation. Professor Nalapad, as far as the South China Sea is concerned and Brunei's relations with China are also concerned, uh, we have seen that Brunei has not necessarily been as vocal about, about its claims uh, over the regions of South China Sea as the others have. Uh, is that because it does see, of course, a lot of benefit in also having strong relations with China and also the, the monies that China is then pumping into Brunei? And is that something that India is now hoping to counter? Look, uh, I'd like to point out that, uh, first of all, uh, India's uh, sphere of influence is not merely South Asia, it is Southern Asia. The entire arc, right from West Asia to Southeast Asia. Let's not limit ourselves anymore, Devika, by saying that our natural neighborhood is South Asia. Our natural neighborhood is the whole of Southern Asia, of which Brunei is a very proud component. Now, coming to Brunei, uh, Ambassador has, been, has talked at length about that wonderful country. It's a hub of moderation. The ruling family is a very moderate family. They do not tolerate fanaticism, and the people of Brunei are exceptionally moderate, overwhelmingly so. And I am really surprised that it has taken such a long time for an Indian Prime Minister. I'm very happy that Prime Minister Modi has gone to Brunei, because the symbol of what Prime Minister Modi talks about, which is a moderate culture spread across the world, you know, sabka saath, sabka vikas, the whole entire G20 motto was about Vasudeva Kutumbaka. So I think it's a natural fit for India. And yes, Ambassador is absolutely right. It can be a very major investor in India because it's a very capital rich country. It's looking for avenues of investment. And the ruling family is very smart. If they see a good investment opportunity, and in my view, with decoupling from China happening, India is a wonderful investment opportunity under Prime Minister Modi. I think you may see much more investment coming in. One final point about Singapore. Uh, Singapore was getting by as a kind of a bridge between China and the United States and the West. Today, that bridge is going apart because the United States and China are drifting apart. So the bridge is basically, uh, I mean, no longer as if as if, as necessary now it could therefore serve as a bridge for india in different parts of the world especially southeast asia and singapore has historically been a good friend of india i had the privilege of meeting president tarman uh, last year at the asia dialogue at nimrana fort and i i saw his presentation brilliant his conversation very very strategically minded and i'm delighted that he was chosen as the president of Singapore. He's a staunch friend of India, a staunch patriot of Singapore, and a staunch friend of India. And it's excellent the prime minister will be meeting President Tarman uh, during this visit. Singapore is very important, and it can be a hub for India, just as being a hub for China for so long, but it is no longer able to serve that purpose because there is a decoupling of visible decoupling that is taking place, which will become clearer and clearer over the next few years between China and much of the rest of the world. Thank you, Devika. Okay, I bring in, of course, uh, also Mayor General uh, Sanjay Meston into the conversation. Mayor General Sanjay, Sanjay Meston, if you can just help shed some light uh, on the geographical significance then that Brunei holds and why nations such as China and the US have continued to show interest even though it's it's a tiny island nation. Uh, Devika, very pertinent question asked. I would uh, like to play it in a very different manner. The question could be what is the strategic interest of India in South China Sea? Now when I say South China Sea, it is surrounded by nine countries and the 10th country is China. Therefore, the battle space is the South China Sea, where the battle of influence is there between China 
between uh, by india and of course the other court members so this is what uh, i would put it in the larger perspective now all these countries of asean and also most of the pacific island countries including new guinea papua new guinea where our prime minister had been last year uh, they definitely have fears from china because of the traditional especially these uh, nine countries which i just stated uh, the nine dash line also is there in the south china sea which china tries to control it and tries to even make military bases in uh, parasail islands pratley islands and there are other group of islands which are disputed by these nine other countries including brunei so therefore all these 14 country uh, sorry nine countries which are surrounding south south china sea obviously have got threats perception from china and therefore the natural ally is uh, india now when i come to uh, i i do agree with uh, professor nalpur you know we today have to start looking at a strategic neighborhood uh, which implies the southeast asia also which includes south china sea and today why this area is important strategically because the south china sea uh, the uh, ships uh, operating uh, for trade of the chinese 64% of the trade passes through malacca strait and that's a choke point and therefore it is also trying in consultation with uh, thailand to go for the istumas of craft which is going to be a very very costly affair whether it comes or not no one knows and the other is of course the sunda strait uh, which is uh, between the, the two states of uh, indonesia so china is actually hemmed in into the south china sea and therefore india also today needs to start having lot of strategic influence in all these nine uh, countries which i just highlighted and therefore we have to continue our influence and our act uh, act east uh, policy act east asia policy is act exactly on the correct line and therefore the prime minister of india has rightfully visited brunei and of course singapore prior to that he had visited malaysia and i am quite sure uh, shortly he'll also visit uh, uh, vietnam also i think he had visited and uh, probably indonesia also may be on the cards in the near future now so also cambodia so keeping all these factors in mind the strategic influence obviously i have highlighted uh, at the geopolitical level and therefore these countries on the periphery whether it is brunei and singapore they are very very important to us so asean and india's relation with them and especially also with the pacific island countries is also equally important so we have to hem in china here along with other quad members and i foresee maybe in the near future probably we should not be surprised if all these countries Uh, along with quad members something of a far eastern nato may be in the offing in the near future so india has to take lot of active interest and i am very glad the indian navy is making lot of headway to this extent we have just had the nuclear uh, second nuclear powered submarine uh, also able to launch k9 missile so these are steps in correct direction and we have got very good bilateral relationship with philippines and other countries where even uh, we have uh, exported brahmos missile so what i'm trying to say is you have asked a very good question the strategic significance of all these rim island countries is very very important to us and therefore the visit to brunei from bilateral point of view also okay. uh, with brunei is important because of the trade etc and also we have the ttc the telemetry tracking and uh, control station right so a lot of space deals are uh, likely to be signed and maybe we may even have a kind of a space station even in uh, that place uh, brunei because uh, being in equator the cost of uh, launching is cheaper because okay. the fuel is less yes so i think it is important strategically important uh, devika okay uh, patikrit bring you into the conversation major and sanjay mason has uh, clearly explained why brunei is significant for india but you also have Uh, the brunei sultan rolling out the red carpet for prime minister modi what is the strategic significance then that india brings to a small island nation the south china sea uh, like brunei so uh, let me put it this way uh, more than a decade back when i was in singapore doing my masters uh, in nanyang technological university for a long period of time uh, asian states were looking for india to play a critical role in the asian region um and most of the dialogues that used to happen over there in the university they used to talk about india uh but unfortunately 
if you look at from 2004 to 2014, uh, you know, India did not show much importance or interest in actually, you know, taking that step forward. It's only in the last, say, one decade it has started showing more interest uh, in ASEAN, uh, you know, and in most of the countries. So I don't look at it Brunei as a case in isolation. You have to look at it as from the larger strategic perspective of India's deepening relationship with ASEAN. That is the most important thing. Secondly, uh, you know, we have started late. Let's not, uh, you know, presume that the moment we start it, uh, we will get results right away. Uh, if you look at the ASEAN mindset, the mindset is like this. They depend on United States for strategic security. They depend on China for their economic security. And there are countries which are extremely uncomfortable right now because of China's, uh, you know, uh, salami slicing policy or demographic change. I have seen in Singapore when Chinese expatriates, or Chinese actually come to study, they become very, very cautious if they stay back because they feel that someday, uh, you know, what has happened to Taiwan may happen to Singapore because of the size of the Chinese population. In fact, the Chinese population within Singapore are very wary of the mainland Chinese. So there are challenges. In that context, what role India plays is up to India to decide. Uh, you know, you cannot directly take on China right away in South China, South China Sea. Many of these countries, especially Philippines and Vietnam, we have been developing relationships in terms of selling weapon systems. From the perspective of Singapore, we have elevated the relationship to a level of strategic partnership. Countries like Brunei, countries like Singapore, if you look at their sovereign funds or you know, organizations like Temasek or GIC for Singapore or a country like Brunei, which is extremely cash rich, they can invest in India's next generation, you know, technological areas where India is looking for a quantum leap, whether it's in the, you know, semiconductors, whether it is, uh, you know, other areas of biotechnology, we require investments. And I think countries like Brunei would definitely play a critical role in that. Professor Nalapur is very right in mentioning that as a country, it has always taken the path of moderation. So I think it's a it's an example for you know Islamists in this country also that you need not follow the Wahhabi philosophy or Wahhabi principle. There are other countries which are extremely progressive and yet Muslim majority countries. Uh, whether it is the Central Asian countries or a country like Brunei, even for a country like Indonesia, uh, which which is a Muslim majority country, but they hold on to their uh, you know Hindu culture. So it's important from that perspective. Brunei is important from that perspective. Most of these countries in the ASEAN region are individually very small to take on China. Right. That's one. So they are looking towards India to actually play a role. It doesn't mean that you, we are going to go and fight their war. Yeah. And important thing is this. Just give me 10 seconds more. The kind of interference we see in or by China in South Asia. Uh, you know, at the same time, if we do not expand into South China Sea or Southeast Asia, uh, you know, if you do not create a hedge, the Chinese interference, the Chinese regime change game, the Chinese uh, tendency to finger your country, that is not going to stop. Not that it will stop if you go there, but we are actually creating hedges. That is the most important, important thing in terms of naval agreements, in terms of strategic partnership, in terms of investments, and in terms of giving weapon systems, which are critical. Most of these countries are looking forward to weapon systems from India, more than 10 years back, none of these countries were getting the kind of offensive weapon system which today India is willing to sell and have started selling. Um, that is a very critical thing. So overall, let me tell you this thing. We have started late. Uh, it's a very good step in the right direction. Right. But let's not presume that they would disown China right away. They cannot afford to. So they will have good relations with both sides and we have to play along. Okay. Back to you. Professor Madhav Nalapad, bringing you back from the conversation, so I just want to understand from you, taking forward what Patikrit has said, uh, we've also seen in the past few uh, months itself some growing Chinese aggression, especially, uh, you know, videos surface on and off of what happens with the uh, Philippines Coast Guard between the Chinese Coast Guard and the Philippines Coast Guard in the South China Sea. So there are certain aggressive attempts and maneuvers being made by China amidst that when India also, when the Indian Prime Minister makes a visit to a nation like Brunei, how do we then somewhere move from being an alternative to China to being the primary option for a partner 
for a major in, partner or is that not a possibility and most countries would want to maintain great relations with both devika this nine dash line of the chinese is nonsense is absolute fiction let's say we draw a, a, a nine dash line that uh, encompasses almost the whole of the atlantic ocean is nonsense let's call the chinese nine dash line what it is utter nonsense they have no rights to encroach on the exclusive economic zone of any of the countries southeast asia and india stands by international law in that respect interestingly so does russia i'd like to say as far as china is concerned its great economy is powered because of rampant trade with democracies united states india uk germany you name it rampant trade if that trade starts drying up and strategic reasons are making it imperative that it dry up where is this great chinese economy it's going to go into a tailspin it will be going into a complete collapse and i'd like to say finally because i'm very short of time as far as the south china sea is concerned the quad can play an important role and i've said from the start from 2017 onwards that the, uh, the the prime minister modi and shinzo abe revitalized the quad i have said from that time onwards the quad should become a security provider a net security provider as a collective and if the united states has a better leadership a more able and strong leadership than president biden which i think will come under either harris or trump i can tell you when that role will be played and it is imperative that the united states and india become partners because that's the only way we can secure the indo pacific uh, against china the only way is these two big democracies coming together and i'd like to say in my view that hopefully will happen quite soon and then devika we become a, a a a net security provider to the united states and i mean to the to the whole of the indo pacific thank you all right ambassador mahesh sachdev same question to you sir i just want to understand from your perspective is there a possibility of then india becoming the primary choice of some of these nations or do they have to continue a balancing act between uh, india and china as far as important regional powers are concerned uh yes uh, mr chopra i i agree with uh, what professor nalpat and uh, parakrit have said uh, but the nuances differ uh, it is the region was called indo china with india coming first and china coming later historically and uh, somewhere down the line over influence waned and the chinese influence grew now through these visits through these engagements i think we trying to uh, set the balance right it is the part the region is important for us not only for trade but for uh, historic reasons for uh, containment of china for example and uh, uh, for investments and economic growth singapore is our sixth largest trading partner with 36 billion dollars trade last year for example it was the largest investor in fdi terms in india last year after the mauritius route has been blocked by change of the trade regime the treaty which in which made them tax free uh singapore has risen the uh the, the, there is significant indian community there and singapore is known for its meritocracy it's uh, uh it's uh, above the weight punching capability in technological sectors and i think semiconductors uh, ai and other areas where india and singapore can collaborate i should add here uh may not sound right but uh, singapore treats its indians differently and one would like to see certain improvement in uh, its indian communities profile uh the uh, less said the better uh indians profile has been changing 
there are more Indians NRIs in uh, in in Singapore than the ethnic Indians with Singaporean passports now, and Indian NRIs have made a name for themselves in uh, commerce, in trade, and in other areas. And I think uh, this is something which can be uh, which can which can be sustained and carried forward. Uh, lastly, I think trade between India and Singapore need to be tweaked in terms of the treaty terms with the bilateral trade treaty has uh, certain components that Singapore has abided by in letter but not in spirit. For example, natural persons entry from India to Singapore is still controlled while in the uh, bilateral treaty it should have been free. So all these things, I imagine, would find a uh, place in the uh, agenda of the Prime Minister during the visit. It comes after two weeks ago, the, the quadrilateral meeting when four Indian ministers visited Singapore for economic and political talks. Right. Uh, so there, it has been well prepared, and I think we have right to expect uh, uh, substantial results from Prime Minister's third visit to Singapore. Thank you. Okay, I'll leave the last word with Major General Sanjay Messansa. I just have a minute left, but does this visit then send out a strong message to China? Yeah, obviously it sends a strong message to China Sea. Uh, again, I would like to highlight that South China Sea, all the countries surrounding it, ASEAN countries, uh, today, whether it is India, whether it is China, whether it is United States, Australia, all these countries, we are looking for strategic space over there, strategic influence. And rightfully so, India is also doing exactly the same. What will be the response of these uh, countries? Their response is, they would do a balancing act with all these countries. But once their national interests are th uh, threatened, once their security interests are threatened, let me tell you, these countries obviously would link towards India, towards the United States, towards Japan, towards uh, Australia, the Quad members. So this is what... Uh, uh, I think is the final outcome of this. So we are doing a correct thing by uh, going to these countries and it is a game today of strategic influence which all countries are actually going to do. And uh, when they are threatened, these countries, obviously I told you where they will uh, start uh, leading on to. Thank you, Devika. Okay. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.